Welcome to our webinar today for Getting Paid What? An insider's look at compensation practices. My name is Andrew Kite. I'm the executive director of the Family Business Center of Loyola University here. And we're delighted to have you with us what, for what promises to be an interesting, engaging uh, program. Um, after I deliver some initial remarks about compensation, we'll have a real life case study of, from one of our members, Greg Bush of McCarthy Bush Company. So I will introduce him when we get closer to uh, his section. Um, but before we get started, I wanted to give you a quick uh, overview or, or input into how you can ask questions and interact with us during this webinar. In the upper right hand corner of your screen, you should have a, what we call a dialogue box. And in the bottom half of that dialogue box, you should see a little window that says chat and uh, an area that says type message here. If you would like to submit a question during the course of this webinar, please type your message in there and send it in to uh, our people here and they will feed us the questions throughout the webinar. We want to make sure that this webinar addresses uh, the issues and the questions that you all have. So please feel free to submit your questions via the dialog box on your right hand side. All right, next slide please, Ryan. So this afternoon we're going to talk about one of the most challenging topics for family businesses today, compensation. Compensation seems to raise the level of emotion in all family members from my experience. Um, you know, family members not working for the business tend to feel like family members working for the business are getting overcompensated. Family members working in the business feel underappreciated oftentimes and that they're working their butts off to try to increase the value of the company for the family members who aren't working for the business. So these emotions really drive a lot of the, the tensions that surround the topic of, of compensation. Now the key word in each of these situations is emotion. Because compensation really involves uh, one family member getting money that another family member might not be getting, it raises emotions and feelings that are really generated from the family roles and from the family uh, relationships. And uh, it raises feelings that maybe something unfair might be happening. Uh, so in our webina webinar today, we're going to work to understand how compensation causes this tension in the families and the common mistakes that families make when they're approaching the topic of conversa uh, compensation. And we're going to talk about how possibly we can create a process to manage these tensions or a process to deal with compensation issues effectively. And we'll see a, a, an evolution uh, of these things in the story of McCarthy Bush companies. And we'll talk a little bit about using advisors to deal with issues of compensation, or at least the role of advisors in that process. So next slide, please. Um, so one of the reasons that uh, compensation is such a challenging issue is that fair isn't always equal, and equal isn't always fair. You know, family bases are, uh, families are, are, are based on an ethos of equality, and, you know, in, especially in the sibling generation, we feel that the equality is the rule, and if one sibling gets something that another sibling isn't going to get, that this is unfair. You know, and and it, its root it's based on the family ethos of uh, attention and love, but this bleeds out into issues like uh, my younger sibling got a car at age 16, and as an older sibling, I had to buy my first car. You know. Um, that one sibling gets more leniency than the others, that uh, there are different rules uh, based on which sibling you are. So you know, the underlying belief here is that is what is right in the context of the family is that we should be equal and that what is fair is to be treated equally. Now this gets complicated when you get into a uh, family business context because businesses are really more of a meritocracy. You know, the reality that we have to face as family members is that we each have a variety of gifts and skill sets and that while equality may be the rule on the family side, it often feels unfair and, and creates resentment to try to apply those rules of equality on the family business side. Um, you know, when family members with different talents and different contribution levels to the company uh, company are compensated equally, it can raise tensions uh, in the family. So understanding the root of this dynamic is critical and 
uh, you know, the classic example is that, you know, one sibling enters the company, uh, the older sibling enters the company and works their way up in both position and salary. And then three or four years later, when the next sibling enters the company, they start at the same salary as their older, more established sibling. You know, usually this is based on the parents feeling a sense of needing to treat the, the kids equally, you know, from a family role perspective and uh, involves, you know, some level of guilt from the parent side that they can't treat the siblings different for fear of the reaction, you know, if they did, you know. A good part of the ethos of equality is uh, that it can, you know, stress the unity of the family and emphasize self-sacrifice for the good of the whole, but it rare, rarely has that intended effect when we put it into play. Um, you know, family members with different skill sets and different work ethics contribute differently. And so that equality uh, isn't always fair in the context of the business environment. So a family having a conversation about that and creating some clarity for family members is uh, an important conversation to have. Um, next slide, please. Um, so let, let's talk about a look, some of the common compensation problems that families run into that create the tensions uh, around compensation. You know, the first is a job pay mismatch. This can go two different ways. You know, one, time, you know, one example that families often do is that parents undercompensate their children, trying not to build a sense of entitlement. They want their kids to feel a sense that they have to earn their way up and they don't want to overcompensate them uh, because they don't want to build that sense of entitlement. But what this does is that it create, can create a sense of resentment in the next generation, and it often communicates a lack of respect for the skill sets and talents that a family member brings to the business. You know, the flip side of that, which is another probably more common stereotype about family businesses, is that they overcompensate their children uh, oftentimes using that as a way to take care of them, um, that we really want our kids in the business, so we're going to overcompensate them, so it makes it very hard for them to decide not to come in, into the business. But the challenge with this is that this can put golden handcuffs on the child, and that uh, the child then can't choose to uh, pursue another career. Um, or if they're unhappy to move on to anything because they can't get a comparable salary anywhere else. You know, in essence, it, it kind of creates a little dependency in the family uh, and is really emphasizing the caretaking role of the parent, which can be difficult. The next common problem that we run into is sibling rivalry. You know, I like to call it the he's getting more than me dynamic. Uh, being from a family of three brothers, I've seen that firsthand. Um, and this really uh, tends to veer away from any rational measures of compensation. It's just merely uh, a sibling reacting to the concept that this another sibling is getting more compensation than, than them and just inherently that that's wrong. Again, it's kind of going back to that family ethos that as a family member, we're equal. So if my sibling gets more than me, then that's unfair. Um, the third problem that we run into with compensation is how to measure performance. Um, you know, this problem comes up most often when we use highly subjective measures of, of uh, performance or there's not a lot of transparency about the process of how we're measuring people's performance. Um, it makes it very difficult and the, the, the less clarity we have about how we're measuring performance, the more it uh, puts the possibility of emotions into the equation. Now, um, families also uh, make the mistake sometimes of compensating uh, family members for emotional reasons. You know, one business owner I talked to said that whenever she had a baby, her father increased her pay. You know, this obviously was helpful in terms of taking care of the next generation, but it raised resentment with her brother who wasn't yet married who felt like, um, well, it, it's unfair that uh, she's getting raises just because she's having kids and uh, made for difficult family discussions. Um, you know, 
the, one of the most common issues with compensation that isn't often talked about in the family and business world is one involving the older generation. A lot of times the older generation has for a long time envisioned that they would just continue to get their salary out of the business until they died and that that would be an expectation or a way that they would fund their retirement. Uh, the challenge that this creates is that uh, it creates a liability for the company in that the company uh, is spending the same amount of money for a decreasing amount of contribution uh, on the return. So when family members make that decision, it, it's best to think about that very carefully and can the company afford to, to essentially pay somebody uh, to not be producing over time. And uh, the last piece um, which I want to talk about is the confusion that family members often run into in terms of their types of compensation. And a lot of the emotions are around the compensation issue come up because of uh, their confusing different types of conversation. Could you go to the next slide, please, Brian? Um, and this involves confusing pay for performance on the job and for excellent performance with compensation for ownership. Uh, so let's get clear about these types of compensation. When we're talking about compensation for your job, it's the whether you're on contract or you're on salary, you have an agreement with about, about how much you're going to get paid. Um, and then if you're at a certain level of the company, you might also be compensated for the performance of of the company or the performance of you as an individual within the company. So your performance for your job is your salary or your contract compensation and your salary or your compensation for performance is your bonus or deferred comp stock options are sometimes included in that. But this is different from the compensation we receive as owners. Um, as owners we receive compensation in the form of dividends and or stock appreciation. Um, and what happens in a lot of families is these all get mixed in together and there's not clarity for family members about the difference between these two. Um, and where this confusion generates tension in families is that it's often between the family members working for the business and the family members that don't. You know, family members that work for the business feel that the, sh the shareholders uh, not working for the company are reaping the benefits of all their hard work and have no real right to the reward or, or the compensation from the company that is provided through dividends. And, and family members not working for the business feel that those active in the, in the business are often taking excessive dollars out of the company uh, and getting perks that none of the shareholders get. And what this is about, again, is about the emotion of the family and somebody's getting more than me. And uh, the reality is that the people working for the company deserve to be fairly compensated for their job and their performance, and the people who are shareholders have a right to a return on their investment, whether that return on investment uh, comes through dividends and or stock appreciation. Um, so we as family members need to get clear about that and have conversations to determine what is agreed upon and fair amongst uh, the family members on that topic. So we have a couple of questions uh, that are here before I hand it off to Greg. Let's see if I can get to these. Um, let's see. One of the questions is how do I get comparable s salary information? And there are a variety of ways to do that. And Greg will touch on this a little bit in his story, and I can come back to this at the end. But there uh, are a couple of ways to do that. One is through the use of advisors, and uh, you know, then there are a variety of uh, information aggregators that try to share industry data and or comparables based on job descriptions. And we can get um, some information to you on that. Um, and uh, we also have a question here about what guidelines should a company use regarding flexible work schedules and compensation. We'll try to re we'll try to come back to that question after Greg's presentation because I think Greg's presentation will address some of those questions. And there are a couple more questions here that I think I'll try to, to take after 
after our next section, which is a real life case study from one of our uh, member families. Um, so let's hear the story of one of our members and, and, and how they've dealt with the issues. Um, so it's my pleasure to introduce now uh, Greg Bush, CEO of the McCarthy Bush Companies, which were founded in 1897. Uh, McCarthy Bush is a dynamic construction company based in Davenport, Iowa and doing business across the United States and Greg has the distinction of being a graduate of our Next Generation Leadership Institute, the first class of our Next Generation Leadership Institute which graduated in the mid-90s. Um, so Greg, thanks for joining us and I'll hand it over to you for a little while from here. Oh, my pleasure, Andrew. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, I'm Greg Bush. and. <clears throat> I think we experienced every problem he talked about in his lead-in in, in, in our compensation policies. But I would like to go through the evolution of our family compensation system, if you could put the next slide up. Thank you very much. And, uh, and the next slide after that. Uh, we've uh, been one of the founding members of the Loyola Family Business Center, and I, and I want to say the collaboration has been excellent, and they've really helped us in our journey to maintain our family business status. Uh, We've accomplished a lot of the items that they've uh, put forth that are, are our best practices in family business. And we're far from perfect, but I do want to acknowledge their, uh, their help in, in, in having us move forward. And uh, if you put up the next slide. We're going to actually look today at, uh, give you, I'll give you a little quick background of the McCarthy Bush Company and the family members in the company. We'll talk about our uh, pay practice history and go over our current pay practices and structure, give you a little idea of some of the results we've achieved with those uh, pay practice uh, issues and where we've come to uh, full circle to this point in time. And hopefully we'll have some time for question after that. Next slide. The McCarthy Bush uh, uh, family of companies was founded, like, like uh, Andrew said, in 1897 by my maternal great-grandfather, P.F. McCarthy who uh, immigrated from Ireland and then started paving brick roads in the uh, Davenport area. And we've continued to pave roads for the past 115 years. So that by today, next slide, we are at about $300 million in annual revenue, uh, seasonally adjusted 800 employees. We operate out of four divisions with uh, 15 operating locations in the upper Midwest and in the Southeast give you a sense of overview on the next slide. We operate with a holding company structure uh, with a variety of uh, operating companies in the different divisions. Our largest division is our construction division, which includes the original company, McCarthy Improvement, along with several other construction and construction related companies. Our aggregate division is headlined by Linwood Mining and Minerals, which is a two million ton per year chemical grade limestone mine uh, situated on the Mississippi River just south of Davenport. Our real estate division uh, develops and capitalizes on our land holdings that we've acquired over the last 115 years. And finally, our structural steel division, or, or our steel division, we uh, work in the structural type of steel, ornamental iron, duct work, and we do some OEM parts manufacturing for the deers and the caterpillars of the world. When you look at this company and then overlay the family into it, if you'd go to the next slide. In 1982, my father, Jack Bush, acquired control of, uh, of the company. And he pretty much proceeded to bring uh, all of his uh, children or their spouses into the business. He had uh, seven kids and we're all there now. The five brothers, two brother-in-laws. We still have one, one, one cousin on the McCarthy side, my mom's side. And in the past year, we bought it. We've brought in three members of the fifth generation of uh, of the family to to the corporation: a, a son of mine, a nephew, and a niece. So that if you look at the next slide, you can see that uh, there are family members pretty much scattered throughout the uh, uh, throughout the company. Uh, most of them are in the construction division due to the, that's the largest as far as the number of companies and the geographic diversity. So really there's more opportunity uh, to spread yourself away from the rest of the family members and create your own niche. But as you can see, there are a significant amount of family members in the business and they hold a variety of positions at all different levels. As I mentioned, in 1982, my father took control of the company, and so that's where we start on our compensation journey. If you'd move to the next slide, please. 
uh, it really started with my dad, and I break this up into three phases of where our compensation has moved from 1982 till today. The first phase I call the paternalistic phase, and that was the first um, 15 years or so, and that is dad set the pay. We didn't ask questions. We were told what it was going to be. And you know, there are actually some advantages to that type of a pay system. It's quite simple. Um, he had the moral authority to tell us what our pay was going to be. He, uh, he didn't use a lot of input or external input. It was mostly relative to what other non-family members were paid in a particular position. But there was some compression of the salary range of the family members, keeping the bottom and the top relatively close. Uh, it was certainly not a uh, transparent type of pay system. Basically, the, we didn't see where the, what the inputs were. We just were given the output, and that dad would tell us what our salary was going to be. And the results of what he told our, uh, said our salary was going to be were not available to other family members. Uh, at the end of 1997, and it became, my dad finally decided to turn over the presidency of the corporation to me, and I was not comfortable that uh, my siblings were going to be uh, happy with me uh, dealing with the pay issue in the same way my father had. So in a collaborative effort with my siblings, we worked on what I call the hybrid system, uh, the second phase, if you will, from 1997 to 2010. And basically what this was was a two-step process. First, we engaged an outside consultant to do a, um, a Hay or a Hewitt type job analysis for all of the family members as far as what their pay should be based on analyzing their uh, span of control and their authority in their particular jobs and comparing it to outside uh, sources in the upper Midwest to determine what the appropriate pay range was for each of the individuals. That would have been simple enough right there, but then we moved on to step two of that process, and it was a more subjective process, and that was somewhat of a collaborative effort amongst the family to agree on what adjustments would be made to these salaries, and what effectively happened was there was some of the, the ones at the higher end of the salary range gave a little bit of that back, and the ones at the lower end got a little bit more. It was a compromise uh, system, to say the least. And so there were elements of subjectivity and objectivity into this hybrid system. Um, over time, when we started out, everybody knew what the formula was to adjust each person's pay. So when the numbers came over the fence from the outside consultant, they would understand what was done. But over the years, people got promoted or people moved to different positions in the company, and the formulas became much more complex. And there was a, a loss of awareness of the, the second part of the system. So I call it somewhat of a semi-transparent system in that they sort of under, the other family members sort of understood the process, but if you didn't deal with it almost on an annual basis, you'd kind of forget how it all came together. And it became somewhat of a very complex system over the course of the 13 years, the, 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 the going back over the history and, and, and the formalization of what we did was somewhat a, a record-keeping exercise. The one thing we did have here was a very open system with the results in that everybody's pay was available to all family members to, you know, to see both their, uh, their salary and their bonus. Um, the overlay of the subjective part, again, added some uh, flattening of the total pay structure and a little uh, an element of socialism socialism if you will into the family portion of pay in 2008 uh, my father um, became ill and he ultimately passed away in 2009 and during the course of this time uh, people started to have some frustrations with our current pay system due to a couple reasons I think mostly due to a lack of understanding but also the feeling that dad wasn't there anymore as an oversight, just keeping, keeping his hand on the tiller a little bit. And so there was a, a significant amount of frustration. And so in 2010, we decided to overhaul the uh, pay system again and get to our current status, if you put that slide up. And it really is effectively a market rate. Uh, due to the loss of our, our, our mobile, the mobile oversight, uh, the, the uh, 
moral oversight authority of my father. And also, as we were preparing to get the fifth generation into the company, we felt like we ultimately had to go to a extremely understandable system that everybody could uh, be able to grasp. Additionally, at this time, uh, originally my father was the board of directors and we had an outside advisory board. We also had to change our governance model. So we evolved to an actual board of directors with four elected insiders and three outsiders on our board. So we have a strong outside influence to our actual board of directors. Well, what we elected to do for this new system was we elected to use our three outsiders as our family compensation committee. And they effectively set compensation for all the family members working in the business. Now, they obviously don't do that alone. They use outside sources. We went to uh, Hewitt and did another study for all the family members, again, updated our study, and they basically bless that result and implement it. Um, but there are a couple things that we do differently uh, that are kind of interesting. And these are specific to our, uh, somewhat counterintuitive. The first thing is we made it an opaque system in that all the family members, we went from the open system, which is somewhat more the recommended, to the opaque, where nobody knows what every other family member is making, including me as the CEO. Um, all of our pay for family members is handled by an outside payroll service, and we just give them a total number, and they split it up among, they give us a total number, and they ultimately split it up. So the only ones who actually know the, the pay number of every employee are the outside compensation committee and the outside payroll service. Um, knowledge of everybody's pay and openness is, is an important factor for building trust, but by moving the compensation to the board of directors, uh, the outside members, and not having it rest with the sole member of the family has given the family members confidence that the pay is uh, appropriately administered and nobody is taking advantage of the situation. So they are comfortable with the uh, pay being opaque to all the, uh, you know, not available to the other family members. This, uh, this system is also quite understandable because the reality is we can all go on the internet and put in our job descriptions and scale and get a fairly good idea of what our pay is probably going to be. Um, there also is an element of trust in there. You have to, I mean, if we all wanted to dig real hard, we could ultimately figure out what other people's pay is, but uh, we haven't had much of that in, as an issue at this point in time. As we all know, salary is only one part of the compensation. Let's just move for a minute over to uh, the other potential, the other parts of compensation, if you could bring up the next slide. In our family, obviously, we do have salary, and then we add a second piece which is called a heritage dividend, next slide, which I'll talk about in a minute. But let's put up the third slide and go to the bonus part of the salary. The history of our bonus at McCarthy Bush Company for the first two phases of our compensation systems was it was 100% subjective. The reality was in the first phase, it was set 100% by my dad. And in the second phase, it was set 100% by me. And as we moved forward, there was some concern uh, about complete objectivity and the family members in that. So we elected to go to a new bonus system, if you'd put up the next slide. Today our current bonus practice looks something like this. It is, um, first of all, the thing we do is we establish a bonus pool just for the shareholders. And basically, this is a formula, formulamatic process. We take our net income before tax, and this is after all other bonuses to all other uh, company employees has been paid. We take that amount of money, we subtract a, uh, a return on capital to the company from that amount, and for every dollar above that, a percentage of it goes into a pool for bonus potential for the employee, uh, the family employee members. At that point, the pool is turned over to our outside compensation committee, and they determine the actual final bonuses. Now, those bonuses can be up to 70% 70, 70 of an individual's uh, salary. There's a cap on it. And instead of it being 100% subjective, it is based on 
go, uh, 70 percent of that bonus is based on goals, objectives that are preset by uh, in collaboration with the compensation committee for the individual family members and a performance input from a CEO. And 30 percent of that salary is left to the subjective uh, will of the compensation committee so that we have a much more objective bonus policy than we've had for the company. Uh, the interesting part of that that we've left, and this is more from a historical perspective, is after the bonuses have been calculated, if there's anything left in that bonus pool, it is distributed equally to all of the shareholders that are working for the company. And this we call a heritage dividend. It's something that we had done historically as a way to uh, a somewhat of a leveling mechanism for the shareholders uh, that are working in the company. This is our current compensation process at McCarthy Bush Company, and, and uh, it's, uh, as you can see, somewhat of an evolution and an ongoing process. But if we can look at the next slide, I'll give you a sense of some of the results we've had over the past two years. First is that there was a, uh, a sibling, amongst the sibling generation, there was a, uh, it wasn't even a potential uh, family conflict, but it was a real conflict, just the fact that one individual of seven was responsible for everybody's complete uh, compensation, salary, bonus, and dividend, and that was uh, actually just not acceptable to, the other, to many of the other family members, and we felt we needed to do something to improve that. And by doing what we've done, it's taken a tremendous strain off of the shoulders of the family members and a tremendous uh, source of, of conflict resulting in a, a, a more harmonious atmosphere, among, atmosphere amongst the family members. Uh, they really can't point fingers at any family member as far as their compensation. They have to look and work with our outside directors if they have any issues regarding compensation. And it's interesting that the lack of transparency has also been helpful as long as they feel that there is a fair process in place we have actually had greater success with that lack of transparency, and it's made that less of an issue as far as what individuals are actually getting paid. And the reality of our pay structure is the spread has been broadened, and we don't have as many options for compression as we used to have. So the pay spread, even though it's broadened, is less of an issue than it had been when it was controlled by family members. Additionally, if people feel like the salaries are based on, on, on basically objective principles as opposed to subjective feelings of a brother or a father. Overall, if you go to the next slide, uh, there has been a significant improvement in fourth generation satisfaction with our current pay structure, and we feel like we're laying a good roadmap uh, for the fifth generation and beyond as we move forward. As you're all aware, pay is probably one of the most con uh, contentious steps that needs to be dealt with in a family business. But in our collaboration with uh, the Family Business Center, I don't want you to believe that it's the only step. So over the next slide, if you would, or, these are a couple of some of the other actions we've taken in our years with, uh, with, with Loyola. We've established a family vision. We do have a fully operating board of directors with both insiders and a healthy contingent of outside directors. We have created a stock buy sell agreement. We've got uh, employment requirements for any fifth generation employees. And we've made several other changes uh, due to this. But really the compensation, you really need to start with that as your number one. We hope that these, uh, these types of issues along with our continued uh, collaboration with Loyola, will help ensure that our, our, our company moves forward into the 21st century and the fifth generation and beyond as a family-owned business. That pretty much concludes my, uh, my remarks, and I would turn it back to Andrew for any questions you may have. Um, well, for those uh, listening in, if you want to submit any specific questions for Greg, you can submit them. One of which has come in, Greg, was um, how are the family members who aren't working for the business did, uh, compensated? Do they get any dividends? Yeah, actually, we do. We do have a dividend policy in place. There is a what we call a standard dividend, and um, uh, for you know, based on your number of shares, um, as it stands today, there is 
all of the all of the siblings are represented operationally in the company. So we haven't really had to deal with the fact. I'm sure at the cousin generation, they will have to deal with where employee where there is no employee in a nuclear family. We haven't had to deal with that yet, so it, it hasn't been a significant issue. Another question uh, that came up was you had referred to Hay and Hewitt job analysis. Uh, can you talk a little bit more about what that is and, and uh, give some folks the background of, of how you use Hay, the Hay Group or Hewitt or those type of companies? You bet. Actually, we originally started out with an independent uh, consultant, uh, Bob Wood, uh, 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 who is actually a, uh, um, a uh, Illinois, I'm sorry, Bob Wilkening, who actually is uh, in the Chicago area as an independent consultant contractor. But the process is, is, is the same regardless of who you use. And that is, they come in, they have a discussion with the individual, determining their span of control, the number of employees, the size of their economic responsibility to the company. They take all these factors in and they develop a point system that assigns a certain number of points to each job as, as they analyze it. They then use that point system and they have tables to compare it to similar type companies and we, with some geographic similarity. You want to try and get them in the regional area so you account for the fact that other, you know, the East Coast has a significantly higher cost of living or things like that. And then they give you a pay range and you have to determine where you want to fit on that salary range. We chose basically the 50 percentile as where we wanted to be, which means half of the people in, the, in that area would be paid slightly more than that, half the people would be paid slightly less. Other companies I know use the 75th percentile as where they peg their salary. But that gives you a salary number for that individual based on their level of responsibility and authority. Mm -hmm. Another question is, have you had to uh, let any family members go? Uh, <laughs> to this time, other than in temporary jobs, no. We have not. But we've had, what we have had to do is um, do significant reassignments of authority. Uh, we've tried to give family members uh, every opportunity to move up the ladder, but I have to say in some cases they weren't able to make that next step uh, and maintain it, so we had to remove them from that position and move them to a position of lesser responsibility. Another question here, uh, have you found that the new compensation model has increased or decreased uh, G5's interest in working for the company? Uh, without question, I would say it's increased because they, uh, uh, as a general rule, unfortunately, I think we've, <laughs> we've had all the issues that can occur. I think each family has a different way of interacting with their children. So I think when there were frustrations, those were, you know, those were probably overheard by the children. And, and so there was some real concerns in their minds as far as whether, um, how things would be done, if you will, at the company. And I think now that they know that there is a system in place and it's a very rational system, I think they're a lot more comfortable taking the risk of moving into the company. One last question before we uh, move on. And um, if there are more questions that come up uh, before the end of the webinar, we can, we can uh, patch Greg back in and have him answer that. But um, the last question was, how did your family decide who was going to be president? <laughs> wow, that's, I think that's a whole other webinar. That, that, yeah, that, that's a hardball question. <laughs> it is a hardball question, and I'll be I'll be somewhat upfront with it. It was um, the process was not uh, neither smooth nor painless. Effectively, what happened was we were we we still had an outside. We were using a, an advisory board. We had an outside advisory board. They were they put significant uh, pressure on my father to to ultimately nominate a successor. Um, he started the process, and we didn't maintain it. What he originally expected to do was he, he thought there should be input of our generation for that, for that position. And so he, we went down that road expecting there would be a, a somewhat of a vote, if you will, as far as a, a preference. And then over time, the outside directors convinced him that that was not the right way to make that decision, and they ultimately um, worked in, in collaboration. They made the decision to put me in the uh, in that position. 
which caused some significant uh, hard feelings among some siblings. That Not that the decision was a, necessarily a bad decision, but that the process that was outlined was not followed. Well, that's a, that's a big key is that one of the most important things about this whole conversation is that the family members perceive that there's a fair process behind everything. And I can, I can say that without question uh, because the reality is I think they feel very much more comfortable with the situation we have in place now, even though in specific instances it was not to their personal financial best interest. Some people, you know, basically got some salary reductions as we moved forward. And uh, but but overall, the level of satisfaction has improved, which I found uh, quite surprising. Mm -hmm. Well, great. Well, thank you, Greg. We'll we'll come back to you. There are a couple of questions that have come in that I'd like to come back to you after we we finish up uh, and have you answer. But uh, if we can move on quickly, we'll try to get through the end of our slides and come back to uh, the remaining questions that are are out there. So, next slide, please. Um, so, one of the keys here is that we're as I just mentioned, you know, creating a process that builds trust. We know that secrecy around compensation practices in the family business have a huge capacity to uh, destroy trust. So one of the keys we want you to take away from today's webinar is that transparency builds trust, secrecy destroys trust. Now, in, in the McCarthy Bush example, we've seen that it doesn't necessarily mean that everybody knows everybody else's salary, but what it does mean is that everybody feels like uh, there's a system for making compensation decisions and that process is perceived as fair and objective um, and that having this helps to eliminate some of the emotional noise we generate in our family business system. You know, if we have a level of trust where we can be transparent about uh, the compensation practices and, and how we decide those numbers and how those numbers are tied to performance and industry standards, it's far more likely that we're going to avoid some of the emotional tensions around family compensation. And ultimately, uh, it increases accountability and in the end run, accountability uh, in enforced or, or implemented well can increase everybody's comfort level and actually increase family members' self-esteem because uh, accountability helps build self-esteem, as we know, and kind of looking at the development of, of the next generation. Um, the other thing that I want you to take away is, and the Bush family's a, a great example, is that uh, we can't often jump instantly to the ideal compensation structure, that it may take us several steps together, and we don't just want to just instantly uh, throw open the doors of information if we've never shared information before and jump to uh, the type of uh, situation where Greg is. Oftentimes it takes a couple steps to get there uh, before we can make those changes. Next slide, please. So the first step um, that I would encourage you all to think about as a family is developing a philosophy for compensation. And what I mean by that is looking at uh, how we are going to approach uh, compensation. You know, is, is our strategy to try to attract the top talent in the field? Um, and if so, what does our compensation structure need to look like to get there? Um, or as Greg mentioned, you know, when we look at benchmarking salaries across the industry and geographic region, what is our compensation in terms of where we want to be in that range of salaries that inevitably comes up? Do we want to be in the 50th percentile, the 70th fifth percentile, etc. If we have a philosophy, it's much more likely that people are going to uh, support the, the process. You know, as, as Greg indicated, family members may not always get what they want out of the system, but if they perceive the system as fair, they're much more likely to support it. So in developing the philosophy, thinking about our, how will we benchmark company positions? And what are the industry standards? How are we going to compensate uh, the achievement of both family and non-family employees on short and long-term goals? You know, that's another key to the compensation process. Is you know one of the strategic advantages of a family business is that we take a longer-term approach, but oftentimes we make the mistake of with our compensation practices 
emphasizing the short-term goals because oftentimes the short-term goals are more measurable. So the bonus structure and or compensation structure is weighted towards the short-term gains. But uh, we want to try to make sure that um, we are also uh, taking into account the long-term goals of the family and the business and living up to those goals as well in the compensation structure. Next slide, please. All of this is to say that what we're trying to do is build the level of unity and cohesion in a family. This, some of you may have seen this chart before, but this is something that we're talking about more and more, and this is coming from research that's been done on families that have been around for over 200 years. And what this research has really shown is that a family needs four basic components of connection with each other. They need the financial success uh, of connect and connection that comes through uh, financial success uh, as a family in terms of using financial uh, financial resources for family needs. They need cohesion that's built through the financial success of the business that uh, family members are, are benefiting from the business success of the business. But what this research showed is that um, the financial variables only create connection and cohesion amongst a family in the short term. That for long-term success, we need to have the right mix of connection to each other as family members, knowing what's going on in each other's lives, caring for uh, and supporting each other over time. Uh, and we need a significant amount of uh, pride and identity in the business itself um, and what the business brings to our family. So it's essentially is what does the business bring to the family and what does the family bring to the business? And if we can articulate those things, uh, we're going to be much better off. And in the, in the realm of compensation, uh, if we can, can uh, have that broader vision, we're more likely to uh, create processes that are fair for, and, and whole for everybody. Uh, next slide, please. Um, the next thing that we want you to uh, realize is that especially that the more shareholders you have not working for the business, the more you need to educate the shareholders about the compensation process. You need to educate them about the uh, importance of retaining and attracting talent. So this isn't just about compensation of family members, but it's about devoting corporate resources to uh, attracting and retaining talent. Uh, as uh, as we move forward, I think this is going to be one of the biggest challenges for, for companies is attracting and retaining uh, people who can deal with the challenges that the business market is going to put forth. You have to educate your shareholders about business performance and how do we measure it and how does that relate to compensation. You need to educate your shareholders about the role of the board uh, in that process. Um, and use benchmarking and industry standards. And to answer an early question, earlier question, is there are advisors uh, that you can use for benchmarking? Um, a lot of industry associations do benchmarking surveys within their industries that can be used uh, to develop compensation. There are several online uh, compensation aggregators who develop based on job descriptions, uh, ways to uh, compare uh, job descriptions and locations, as Greg was talking about. One of those is salary.com, but there are, there are many of those out there. Um, and then you can hire specific companies that will specifically come in uh, and do in-depth studies of your compensation structure, your organizational structure, and provide you data uh, on those. And those are the Hay Groups, the Hewitt and Associates, folks like Bob Wilkening. And if you like information or contacts with those type of people, we can help you uh, make some of those connections here at the center. Uh, next slide. Um, the, so this is the last thing I want to touch on before we delve into some of the remaining questions. And there are a few of them out there. Um, but just to try to wrap up the formal part of the presentation, and we'll, we'll stay on as long as people uh, have questions. Um, but some tips to family harmony. Number one is 
um, I think one of the, the keys to um, creating, you know, laying the foundation for a good family business environment is to build the self-confidence of your children, hold them accountable, get them uh, experience outside the business if possible to uh, have them benchmark their own performance um, and recognize performance effectively because self-confident kids are going to be less entitled and are going to, if you have fair processes, uh, be satisfied with uh, fair processes. Um, second piece is you need to create the process that is perceived as fair, and that may look slightly different in each family. Uh, and the process that you use to create that process ha uh, has to involve parties that will be affected by the policy in, in the discussion. And using good governance through family councils, boards of directors, or, or family meetings, those are all tools that you can use to help develop that process that's perceived as fair. And the final piece is just building a worth act, work ethic in the family is that we uh, want the image of the family uh, in the business to be one of working hard and earning what we make and not one that uh, plays into the consistent stereotypes um, that we hear about family businesses that nepotism is evil, so on and so forth. Um, with that, uh, Greg, I want to come back to some of the questions that the group had for you. Um, okay. And starting with, do family members get any other perks from working in the business, uh, like company cars, more vacation, or flexible schedules? Actually, uh, the, the vehicle, uh, we do a vehicle allowance instead of company cars, and that is standard across the company. So they, for whatever level they fit in, they're, they're allotted that, but it's not different than any of the other employees. We do allow a little bit more flexibility as far as um, uh, on the vacation side because the reality is what we do as a family, at least once a year, we will take a family trip. Um, it's traditionally been a cruise, but uh, we do go away. Uh, you know, our, our philosophy has always been you got to have some fun together too, not it just can't all be work. So we have allowed some flexibility on vacations regarding that. Um, Schedule-wise, no, it's uh, everybody is pretty much held to the same standard as far as a work day. Um, so there's a few minor items, but overall, I mean, when you look at uh, you know 401k, the, our benefit program, there the, the family is pretty much in the same the same capacity as all employees. Mm -hmm. Uh, another question for you, Greg, uh, was does your family require uh, that family members get outside job experience prior to joining a family business? Uh, yeah, absolutely. That was one of the biggest lessons we learned in the fourth generation, and unfortunately we learned it the hard way, and that is we didn't, that was not a requirement at that point in time, and uh, it was probably one of the, the bigger mistakes, because what happens is uh, you know, an individual comes into the, or at least our experience was some of the people came in with outside experience and some didn't. And uh, the concept of uh, of how you fit in a in, in a company becomes muddied if you have the last name of the owner. You wonder whether they're treating you that way because you're a family member or because you're 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 good or or bad, depending on uh, you know the the circumstance. So we felt that we really needed the people. Children, the, the kids really needed to have at least three years of outside relevant work experience before they could come back to the company. And that allows them to get a little bit settled to see how they fit in the world. And we're also strong on this ability of having a good work ethic. We felt it would be developed better. Also, you want them to be able to make their mistakes elsewhere so they don't, you know, they can be a little bit further up the maturity ladder and, and they won't suffer because we all know the expectations of a family member are significantly higher generally than, than a regular employee. Mm -hmm. Another question was, how did you, uh, how were the three outside members of the comp committee uh, decided, um, there are a couple more parts of this, um, was it difficult to choose those and did they have previous connections to the family or success in their own business? Actually, basically, what we did is we looked at the industries that we that that uh, that uh, we service. Uh, one of our individuals is in the construction industry. Uh, another one is in the aggregate mining industry, and the third is was just a local entrepreneurial individual. Uh, two of the three worked for family businesses. Actually, no, all three of them had family business experience. 
only one of them was an actual family member in that business. The other two are outsiders, are outsiders in the family businesses. And generally what we do when we bring in a new member is we, we, we go to the shareholders and we show them the resumes and anybody can submit a potential um, board member to the group for consideration. But we're looking for somewhat industry experience and a little bit of uh, family experience. Uh, but just good thinkers overall. And we've had great success uh, over the history of the company. We've gotten board members uh, of, of the highest quality. I've been very surprised that they would come and work with a small family, a quote unquote small family business for not a lot of money. Uh, but we've had the president of Oscar Mayer on our board. We've had the president of Conrail on our board, you know, over, over the history. And it, it just amazed me that these people would be so dedicated and they are excellent, excellent sources for the family to help diffuse conflict and uh, just general business ideas. Mm -hmm. uh, another question here is, uh, is there any pre-employment screening or counseling that you do to determine the suitability of family members for given positions? Ah, great, great question and we're in the process of developing that as we speak. Uh, after we brought the first three and we decided that we even, they, you know, originally all we required was a, it was three years of outside experience and uh, these three came in and we decided, you know, we, we need even more. So our intention is to start developing uh, not only a, a, an ongoing dialogue with individuals who might consider coming back to the company, but doing some pre-screening uh, to determine their, their, their talents and potential abilities, just so we make sure we place them in the right place. And we're also working on developing, actually, development plans for those individuals. Mm -hmm. Another question, and I think this is kind of suited for both of us. Um, there's a, a comment that Hewitt, Hay, Mercer, et cetera, are primarily, primarily sources of public company data. And the question is, do we know of good resources for private company compensation data? Uh, honestly, uh, the best source I usually have is Loyola <laughs> for those mm -hmm. types of questions. But overall, it's, it isn't, I'm not aware of any specific companies that, that, that that delve completely in just pri on the private side. And, and my experience has been that the primary source that has access to that type of data is an industry association because as we know private companies, uh, one of the reasons they like being private is that they like being private. So um, that the greatest sources for some of that private company data becomes the industry associations because private companies have more trust in their industry associations in terms of sharing data um, around things like compensation. Um, another question here is when you're looking at, let's pull this up here, we've got a lot of good questions here. Um, when we're talking about market pay for family members, um, say in G5, uh, are you looking at market for what the company is willing to pay for a uh, that job, or are you looking at uh, what the market rate for that that generation five member could make on the outside for a similar job? How are you? What's the actually what uh, what first? we did is it, uh, again another good question. Um, the reality of the situation is some people we bring in have absolute one hundred percent relevant work experience, and they're somewhat easier to deal with. Uh, but some come in and they really come in as off, uh, management trainees. And I would say it's basically a balance between, uh, there is some balance on that, but we allow that compensation committee to make that decision. And they interview all the individuals and talk to them, and uh, they make that decision. So as long as it's not an uncle or a dad uh, making that determination, so far it's worked pretty well. But the reality is, um, of the people coming in, the three that came in, one basically was flat, one took a pay cut, and one got a pay raise from their previous job. Mm -hmm. So uh, you know what they can make is, is not necessarily, we feel there's some advantage to them in the long term coming back to the family business. So we don't necessarily feel we have to match their previous pay. Got you, got you. Um, this is one that I think the answer is hidden in the presentation that you made. Um, so uh, the question is, as it's written, is there a market rate adjustment for family employees in the same role as a non-family member? 
either as an enticement to attract family members to consider a career within the family business or in recognition that it's more difficult to be a member in the family company. Um, and I'm wondering if that has anything to do with your heritage dividend. Well, and that has a, that's a piece of it, but 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 you know the heritage dividend is the payout. You know that sometimes there isn't any because uh, depending on the year and depending on the bonuses allocated. But the reality, of our situation is that there are there there are significant advantages and disadvantages to, advantages to joining a family business. So we feel that we should start at market rate or as close as we can calculate what that market rate should be, because. As they progress, they're the ones, uh, the family members inevitably have the higher potential for moving up in the hierarchy of the company based on their abilities. Certainly, all ties are going to go to them. So we would hope that they would find uh, that a fair, a fair pay up front and the ability to have a little higher step up for promotions is enough to entice, entice them back into the company. Mm -hmm. We don't want to be so enticing that they want to come no matter what. We want them to. We, we we think they have a level level of commitment, and we have a level of commitment to them. Mm -hmm. uh, here's another question: Have you reduced any salaries of the family due to the unemployment circumstances affecting the country? Uh, have we? No. You, I will tell you what we did. We basically uh, we had a. You know, we we actually had. I mean, this is somewhat, you know, we uh, actually did very well the first few years of the company. We have not we have not any salary reductions, but we have had years where we basically eliminated bonuses for the year <coughs> and eliminated some of the profit sharing that we historically did with family and with the employees. We basically announced to the family members early in the year, in fact, as early as April, that they would not be getting bonuses based on the way the projections as they looked um, as the year went on. And we did give some bonuses to specific non-family employees, but the family would, did not have any. So it was based on the financial data for, and projections for what would the financial impact on the company was going to be rather than just the unemployment data in the community. Yeah, it was really, really a function of what the company's doing because we actually had very, very good results in 08, 09, and 10. Honestly, um, we, were, we, were, we were quite lucky. Mm -hmm. um, one last question that came in, and I think uh, then we can wrap things up, uh, was, uh, I think this may be related to one of the earlier questions, but um, if you had a family member who was a, a great HR manager and was good enough to get an HR job at a large company making 200 grand a year, but you, your kind of framework was that you would only pay your HR manager 100 grand a year, um, how would you approach that? Interesting question, and I'm looking for a good HR manager as we speak. So uh, send me the resume, <laughs> and I'll take a look at it. Um, no, the reality of that situation is um, that, that's that's uh, that, that, that's kind of a, a tough one because we don't want to dissuade family members from coming into the company, but we don't want to force them in the door. So what, what, I, what I've said with my children, and I think each of our own siblings probably looks at this differently, I think the happiness is more important than your ultimate salary. And you have to do, and I've told my children this, I said, you know, I don't care if you come back or not. If you're doing something that makes you incredibly happy, the salary is going to be such, it's not going to be your primary consideration. So if being in HR and the family business is, is very important to you, you should be willing to give up something. Now, I don't think 50% is a legitimate number. Uh, you know, I don't, I don't think anybody should have to suffer quite that much. But there should be some, if, if this is what you really want, you'll, you'll, you'll go for it. But if you don't want to be in that family business, I think you should uh, follow your heart wherever it leads you. Gotcha. Great. Well, thank you, Greg, for your, your sharing in, of your experience and wisdom. And thank you, everybody, for attending us with us. Um, February 2nd is our next center program, and it's uh, about using succession to create sustainability. We hope you all can be with us uh, for what will be an engaging day, talking about creativity and innovation and its importance in the succession process. We'll have two other family members uh, of the center who are uh, sharing how they're staying relevant in a changing world, how they're keeping their next generation engaged. Uh, and their family governance, and then we'll end with a discussion on sustainable relationships and how uh, to uh, 
succeed in succession in your family business uh, through sustainable relationships. So February 2nd at the Four Seasons Hotel, if you want to register, please call our office at 312-915-6490 or shoot us all an email and uh, we'll get you registered. Hope you all will join us on the 2nd and thank you again to Greg. Uh, and you can also go to the website to register, www.luc.edu slash fbc slash events. That's www.luc.edu slash fbc slash events. Thank you all, and we'll talk to you soon.